Good morning. And on behalf of the family, I want to welcome you uh, to this memorial service today. Uh, I am Captain Corey Strand, and my wife and I are the Corps officers here at Royal Oak. And uh, I will tell you that um, I have one wonderful memory of Kathleen, and that is that on our Welcome Sunday, um, we met in the gym for the first time as I was, she was being wheeled up to me and introduced. And I was told that she was going to be turning 97 in the next week. And I said to her, oh my goodness, 97, that's awesome. And she looked up at me and she went, is it? <laughs> so that's, that's how I got to know her. And, uh, and we've had a wonderful relationship over this uh, about year and a half or so. Uh, and we are so honored to be able to um, remember her today. Uh, as we proceed through the service, um, just know that uh, things are going to go um, pretty quickly. There's not going to be a lot of uh, in-between and up and down and that kind of stuff. Um, but but as we before we get started, uh, we just want to go to the Lord and uh, say a quick word of prayer. Lord, we thank you today uh, for Kathleen. We thank you for her life. We thank you for uh, what she means to the people here. And we are grateful for... Um, a long life lived, but also know that uh, we are still experiencing loss today, and, and she's going to be missed, and we are just grateful and thankful that we can celebrate today uh, the fact that she's with you, and thankful for the fact that we know that her life uh, here on earth had a special meaning because of her relationship with you. I ask today that you would be honored through this service and honored through uh, our remembrance of her we pray all this in your most holy name. Amen. Well, when many would visit Kathleen or talk to her on the phone, usually her first question would be, what's happening at the Salvation Army? What's happening at the Corps? Who's there? Who's coming? What's going on? Because it was so important to her, her church community, her family. She wanted community. And then when we would sit and talk, she'd ask again, now what's happening at the Corps? Well, I told you 15 minutes ago, but let's talk about it again. And, and because it was so important to her. And then she would start talking about her family and how important her family was to her, her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Because community was important. And this, the family has selected this song for us to sing together, My Home is in Heaven. And how perfect that the third verse talks about community. Oh, who will journey to heaven with me? Jesus has died that we all may be free. Come then to him who has laid up for you a crown in that home far away. And I feel like we all need to be asking Kathleen today, what's happening in heaven? right? What kind of community are you in right now? And someday we will be able to join her. But today we can join her in song. So I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we sing this song together.
hope that Kathleen has and we can continue to have while we wait for that home far away. You may be seated. I still don't know how to operate this thing. I was looking to see the number of times I spoke with Kathleen in the month of July. 14 times. It was her birthday. And she was trying to convince me to come when the family was showing up to wish her happy birthday. And I tried to convince her that perhaps I should do it at a different time. Because have you heard of COVID? Anyway, so I went a couple of days before the family came and we had a nice visit. I love Kathleen. In the 20 or so years, 21 years, I've been teaching the adult Sunday school class downstairs. Well, it used to be elsewhere, but anyway. I must say that the word that comes to mind when I think of Kathleen Gilchrist is encourager. Whenever the caller ID on my phone said Kathleen, and sometimes I'd be in class and it would say Kathleen, I knew I was going to be encouraged. 11 months ago, I had the privilege of standing here to pay tribute to my biggest booster in my Sunday school class, Commissioner William Roberts, Sr. I went on way too long, I know that. But I think the family still likes me. <laughs> Just saying. While it seems to me that he told other people about me, that's what a booster does. Kathleen told me about me. That's what an encourager does. They let you know what you're doing and how it's impacting them and other people. I'm guessing that she also was a booster too. And I loved having, is the word nonagenarians? People in their 90s in my Sunday school class. So hopefully I have to check and see who's close to 90 so they can put them on the pedestal. <laughs> the beauty of teaching seniors, I guess. But I love the fact that she encouraged me every single time. So I'll put my phone away and I should silence it. Okay. I'm going to read from the obituary contained in the program. You should follow along to see how many errors I make. You might also expect some paraphrasing, as well as what you might think are mispronunciations because of my accent. You might not understand, but there's a recording being made. You can go back and figure out what I said. With the closed captioning, it kind of knows my voice now. All right. Kathleen Gilchrist was born in Royal Oak in 1923 to John and Dorothy Duke. Her family, which included four brothers, lived in Birmingham, and she graduated from Birmingham High School in 1942. After high school, she went to work for General Motors. Then in October 1944, she joined the war effort as a member of the Naval Air Corps WAVES program. WAVES is the acronym for Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. After she left the service in April 1946, Kathleen returned to work at General Motors, where she met Emerald Gohl. Emerald was Kathleen's first husband. Together they had two children, Sandy and Bob, or Sandra and Robert, if you want to be more formal. Kathleen and Emerald were active members of the Royal Oak Salvation Army. She was willing to serve in whatever capacities she was asked. She was a Sunday school teacher working in the primary department. She also volunteered with what we call today community care ministries, counting kettles at the Christmas effort. And she also worked in the kitchen whenever she was needed. Kathleen was widowed in 1983. And in 1986, she married Lamar Gilchrist, affectionately known as Gil who predeceased her 21 years ago. Beyond her stints at General Motors, Kathleen also worked at Hudson's department store 
Burke Lumber Company, and Waterford School District, from which she eventually retired. For many years, she met for breakfast several days a week with her big boy gang. She was a loving mother and devoted prayer warrior for her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Kathleen was predeceased by her beloved granddaughter, Julie Marie Rowland. She is survived by her daughter, Sandy, husband, Ed, her son, Bob or Robert, spouse, Mary, two grandsons, Michael, spouse, Amber. It's always hard to read the parentheses. It's a little awkward. No offense. And Mark, two great-grands, Natalie and Nathan, and her stepdaughter, Janet McNamara. Kathleen went to be with her Lord on Christmas Day at the glorious age of 98, we're told. The thought that the caller ID on my phone will never again say Kathleen Gilchrist affects me in a profound way. It would not be a fabrication to say that I've had more telephone conversations with Kathleen than with anyone else in my Sunday school class. You might think that she called me more frequently than I did, but if you look at the records, it says different. I called her more than she called me. And this phone only goes back three years. Two of those years have been associated with, have you heard of COVID? The COVID pandemic. Someone said that when life gives us lemons, we should make lemonade. And I will say that Kathleen's encouragement was to me, good lemonade. Permit me to share one last story. Once the Corps started to assemble after the stay home, stay safe period, Kathleen would often say to me, Addington, why can't we meet in the fellowship hall for our regular Sunday school sessions? The smart Alec in me was tempted to say, have you heard of COVID? But the more respectful side of me, yes, there is a more respectful side, would respond, I'll see what I can do. I don't know if it's disingenuous because we couldn't do much of anything. We could have met at noon after the well, after their service, but it just seemed a little awkward. But she really wanted the recommencement of in-person Sunday school. But that encouraged me. And it encouraged me to do something that, uh, in hindsight, was not necessarily the best thing to do. I said, hmm, I'm going to make some recordings and put them online and send them so that Kathleen can hear the lesson, even ahead of the actual lesson. I'm sure I didn't score any high marks with Kathleen because that's not what she wanted. She wanted in-person Sunday school. There's a verse in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? When Kathleen was asking me for bread, I wish I could have given her the bread that she wanted. I know that I fell short. I can blame circumstances, but I know that I fell short. And we stayed online until September 5, four months ago, I think four months. And when I walked into the fellowship hall on September 12, guess who was sitting at the table closest to the teacher? Of course, by way of confession, my phone records show several calls that week before we actually met on the 12th of September. I may have been the happiest man in this building on the morning of September 12th, but Kathleen let me know in no uncertain terms that I wasn't the happiest person in the building. I want to believe that I have some kind of understanding of the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15:54 where he writes, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. 
For all who believe in Christ, death is that last step before we receive our glorified, resurrected bodies. The significance of that moment when we are clothed with immortality cannot be overemphasized. James Milton Black says about this in song number 559, on that bright and cloudless morning, all of God's promises to us to share in his eternal glory will have been proven true. If you have trusted in Jesus as your savior, you too will be clothed with an imperishable, immortal body, just like Kathleen will be. I close with a quote from another song, number 558, right next to the one I just quoted. It's by William Cushing, and the title is When He Cometh. Cushing writes, he will gather he will gather the gems for his kingdom, all the pure ones, all the bright ones, his loved and his own. I'm going to plead your indulgence because I'm going to paraphrase the chorus of that song. Like a star of the morning, his bright crown adorning, Kathleen shines in her beauty, a bright gem in his crown, to which I say, alleluia and amen. To my friend, a true and faithful servant of God, I say, well done, or bien joué, or bien hecho, or benefactum, whatever language you prefer. Those are the only three languages I can speak. Well done, good and faithful servant. Before I play, just a few words. Uh, this week I've been thinking back a lot, back to like the 60s, when uh, a group of us Teenagers, late teenagers, would gather in Drayton Plains at uh, Kathleen's house. And uh, because Ed and Sandy and Bob and Mary are such special friends, Kathleen became very special to me, too. Before we retired, from my vantage point back there on the platform, I would look every Sunday to see if Kathleen was here, right in this area, right here. And I'd make sure that either before the service or after the service, I went to say just a few words to her. How are you? Uh, have you talked to Ed and Sandy? Have you checked in with kids or grandchildren? Just casual conversation like that. But I think she liked that, and I know that I liked that. Just being in touch with her and seeing her smile every Sunday morning was, was really something special. One Sunday morning, about, well, it must be over 20 years ago, I played a solo in the Sunday morning service. And at, when I went down to talk to Kathleen after the service, she said, I want you to play that at my funeral. And I said, uh, you know, it's very possible that I'll go before you go. And so she kind of chuckled. But you know what? As she rolled through her 80s and almost all the way through her 90s, I began to think, hmm, that came close. <laughs> but uh, that song was very special to her, and it's my favorite solo that I've played all, of all time. So I ask that you'll bear with us as we play this. The band is reading this without our rehearsal, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm playing on a borrowed instrument. Thank you, Matt. And, uh, but we'd love to like to play this for you. It's, it's I'll Not Turn Back. And what it talks about is when all the things oppress you through your lifetime, it might be tough. It'd be, Christians aren't guaranteed an easy life. But I mean, she spent time in the military during World War II. She was widowed twice. She lost Julie, as we all did. She survived miraculously that horrific accident so many years ago, which we did not think she would survive, and she certainly did. So she's had some hardship along the way, but she stayed true. She's not going to turn back on her Savior. She followed him all the way to the end. So please uh, listen carefully. Think of those words as we play, I'll not turn back.
The first verse is from Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. This was something that was written on a plaque in Grandma's home, so, and we thought it spoke true to her, so we'd like to share it. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God and Jesus Christ for you. Our second reading comes from Psalm 23, some of a piece of scripture Grandma loved. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, good morning. Boy, it's great to be surrounded here by family and friends. Uh, just seeing so many people that I haven't seen in so long. Uh, thank you for being here and, and uh, sharing this time with us as we remember Grandma. On behalf of the family, I've been asked to share some thoughts about our mother, our grandmother, our, and our great-grandmother, Kathleen. First, a few uh, words of gratitude. We want to express our gratitude to those who have loved and cared for Grandma for so many years. To the caregivers from Assured Home Nursing, thank you. You were her aides, her helpers, her chauffeurs, her housekeepers, and her cooks. But more than that, you were her companions, her friends, her listening ears, and her daily assurance. Thank you for literally going that extra mile to pick up food from Kroger, Big Boys, Culver's, Panera, wherever the craving may lead you. <laughs> Your kindness to Grandma means more to us than you'll ever know, so thank you. To the family of faith of the Roy Lowe Corps, thank you. On days when Grandma was lonely, anxious, or hurting, you were there. Your notes and cards of encouragement were greatly appreciated, and having recently gone through her apartment, we're pretty sure she's kept every single one of them. She truly loved your visits and was always anxious to hear what was happening at church. Thank you for your faithfulness. To her brothers, sisters-in-laws, nieces, nephews, and stepdaughters, thank you. Grandma's family meant the world to her, and she loved each one of you dearly. Thank you for your notes, your phone calls, visits, which always made her day. As you might imagine, after 98 years, you build relationships with quite a few people. So for anyone we've missed, we made those, and has made those connections with Grandma, we, th we say thank you. As you can see from the obituary, Grandma lived a long and, and blessed life, so there was quite a lot to consider when deciding what stories and memories we wanted to share as a family with you here today. We could tell you how she was the daughter of immigrants from England, and how her father, John Jack Duke, worked at First State Bank of Royal Oak, but was also an accomplished poet and had several publications to his name. We could share how she was the middle child, the only girl right in the middle between Jack and Bud and Doug and Mike, and how she was a bit of a tomboy, often showing up her brothers and even breaking her collarbone in a football game. We could tell you how during World War II, when her brothers all went to serve, she insisted that she serve as well, and she joined the Naval Air Corps in what was then called the Waves. Of course, we would have to mention the old big boy restaurant and how grandma became such a regular that the manager usually kept the table for her and allowed her to walk right in past the line and take her seat whenever she wanted to. Or maybe we should share how at age 59, she got her driver's license for the first time so she could help my grandfather, her husband, when he fell ill and take him to appointments. There are many memories to share, but for us, the most important story we want to share is how she loved her family and how her tremendous faith in Jesus Christ impacted our lives and the lives of those around her. 
The word family encompassed a lot for grandma. She deeply loved her church family, her parents, her brothers and their families, and of course, her children and their families. After my grandfather passed away, grandma married Gil Gilchrist, and she was blessed to extend her love to Grandpa Gil and to his family as well. Her greatest joys on earth, however, were her children and their families, mom and dad, Ed and Sandy, Bob and Mary, Julie, Mark, myself and Amber, Natalie and Nathan, and recently, a little dog that we've gotten named Finley. She loved that dog. I mean, she really loved that dog. <laughs> I've only have met him a couple of times, and if I'm honest, we were all a little jealous of the attention he started to get. <laughs> and whether gathering together for Christmas, meeting uh, her for breakfast or lunch, or visiting with her at her apartment, she loved being with her family. She was our greatest fan our biggest cheerleader, our personal prayer warrior, and we will miss her greatly. A week ago, when we were sitting together as family remembering Grandma, my uncle said something uh, that I made a quick note of and I'll never forget. He said, without her pressing the issue, who knows where we would be? He was referring to Grandma's persistence in helping people get to know Jesus. And I thought, what a great way to put it. Pressing the issue. That was Grandma. That was Kathleen. Grandma came to faith as a young girl and carried that faith with her into adulthood. Later, after she married and had children, she told her father they needed to get back to church. Her father, knowing the Salvation Army from his days back in England, suggested that they try the Royal Oak Corps. Soon, Grandma decided it was time to press the issue, and the family began to regularly go to church and youth activities at Royal Oak. Because Grandma pressed the issue, my grandfather, my mother, my uncle, all came to know Jesus. And they passed their faith on to their children. And my wife and I have now passed that faith on to our children as well. Indeed, where would we be without Grandma pressing the issue? Grandma's persistent faith was also shown to her brothers and was evident in a note her youngest brother, Mike, or Mickey, sent to her. I'm going to read that for you now. Kathleen I am so glad you are my sister. You set a good example for me to follow. Because of you going to the Salvation Army way back when, I became a Christian. Thanks so much. I love you very much. Can't wait until we meet Jesus and see our family in heaven. Your brother, Mickey. Well, Grandma and her brothers are up in heaven now, together. Grandma was a prayer warrior. There isn't a person in this room who wasn't faithfully and fervently prayed for by Grandma. She prayed for everyone. Not only that, but she firmly believed that God would answer her prayers. In fact, for many years she prayed for my cousin Mark that God would lead him to find this job that, that he's uh, wanted for his whole life and this, uh, just that perfect job. And now Mark will tell you recently he's, he's got that job. And Grandma, if you talk to her, she would say, it's because God answered my prayers. And Mark, I think you would agree with that, that God answered her prayers. You may know that after, over the last few months, Grandma became quite ill. In fact, over the last month, she was very, very sick and rarely had the energy to speak or even open her eyes. Yet when my parents went to visit, they would say, Mom, we're going to pray. And Grandma would immediately light up and, and begin to pray in full, coherent sentences. My mother called this a gift from God, and she hopes that, like Grandma, she can live up to that legacy as a woman of prayer. Earlier, I mentioned that my grandmother's father was a poet. When she was 14, he wrote a poem entitled Kathleen, and I'd like to read that for you now. My only daughter, Kathleen, has kept me worried much of late. Mother blames the change. She's now 14. I thought it was all the things she ate. It seems but yesterday that she would set the neighbors all agog by shining up the tallest tree or chasing mother with a frog. To me, her mother often said, there cannot be from here to Mars a girl who underneath her bed keeps snakes and frogs in mason jars. But now if brother has a toad, she turns her nose up with a scowl. With mice, tis something to behold and hear a real Comanche owl. Although I'm worried very much, her mother's face seems more serene. No more Kath wears a sling or crutch, 
for running touchdowns for the team. No longer she defies the powers or natural laws of gravity, but poses all her waking hours before the bedroom vanity. And mother gives a little sigh and says, though something wrong I vow, like chrysalis to butterfly, she's changing to a lady now. I believe the ending of this poem is appropriate as Grandma Kathleen has shed the chrysalis of this world to claim her heavenly body and to sit at the feet of Jesus. May each of us strive to carry on her legacy of praying for everyone, sharing our faith, and when necessary, pressing the issue. God bless. Thank you. Well, just a few days before Christmas, I went to go visit Kathleen one more time, and I went in, and she was resting, and she just, I said, hello, Kathleen, and I'm not very quiet, so it might have startled her a little bit, but I said, hello, Kathleen, and I, and I held her hands, and she just opened her eyes a little tiny bit and said, oh, it's you, and that was it. But then she sat there as I chatted with her and told her once again what was happening at church. And she rested while I prayed with her and sang a few carols. But that idea of, oh, it's you, just kind of stuck with me. And, and thinking about on Christmas Day, her saying that again, oh, it's you, but to her Lord and Savior. And how beautiful that idea, I don't, it's been on Facebook a number of times lately, it pops up every few years, this painting of a woman and she's literally wrapping her arms around Jesus and just the expression of pure joy and satisfaction as she does that, oh, it's you, finally, I'm home and it's you. And so I think it's fitting the family asked uh, me to sing this song, Finally Home. And the, the chorus just says, just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of touching a hand and finding that it's God's. How beautiful is that? And Kathleen knows that today, and I know more than anything, she'd press the issue, right? Do you know that as well? When engulfed by the terror of tempestuous sea, unknown waves before you roll, at the end of doubt and peril is eternity. Though fear and conflict seize your soul Just think of stepping on shore And finding it heaven Of touching a hand And finding it God's Of breathing new air
Good morning, everybody. I find it to be a great privilege this morning to uh, represent former Corps officers of, uh, here at the Royal Oak Corps uh, who knew Kathleen and were uh, part of ministry with her. And I might add that uh, it, it's a very long list of former Corps officers who could be here this morning. And any one of us, if you were to ask them, we would say, oh, I, I was Kathleen's favorite. No, 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 I was Kathleen's favorite. Because Kathleen had that ability, and, uh, and when I knew her with her husband, Gil, together, they were just uh, the most delightful people and, you know, just supportive in every way. And, you know, it's like you could do no wrong with them. They were just, you know, they were just with you all the way, every time. And so uh, a long list of us uh, bring very, very fond memories uh, to this occasion as we think about Kathleen. A legacy can take many different forms. It can be money. It can be possessions. It can be accomplishments or achievements. But in Kathleen's case, it was none of those things, although I would say that she was a very wealthy woman. Not in terms of those tangible things, but in terms of the very qualities that you have heard expressed this morning by others who have been speaking, in your own memories of her. She had the tremendous quality of faith in God and how that translated into her love for people. That's her legacy. And she was extremely wealthy in those qualities of the spirit in her life that she shared with others. It's just um, a great thing to be able to be at an occasion like this, which on the surface should be very sad. Uh, Sue and I have been here for a couple days and if we've been talking to somebody or, you know, casually with, in a conversation in a restaurant or something, and they say, well, what brings, you to, what brings you back to Michigan? And we're here for a funeral. Immediately a sad countenance comes over them, and they're, oh, that's so sad, that's too bad, you know. We, you know but it's hard, to, it's hard to express to them, well, that's really not the, thank you, but that's not true. This is not a sad occasion. This is an occasion of hope. This is an occasion of joy. This is an occasion of fulfillment of so many promises that God has for us. Many of you, uh, if you have grown up in a church somewhere and were a part of the youth group of that church in your younger years, your teenage years, you may have had the experience of being uh, uh, together for some moment or another with the other, other people, other kids or whatever, and uh, then the leader of the, of the moment, leader of the day, would have said, well, now we're going to go around and everybody's going to share their favorite Bible verse. Now, most teenagers kind of shrivel up at that moment. That's not the most favorite thing they like to do or, or be called upon to do. And so for many of us, we would kind of uh, use that two-word lifesaver. John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. Uh, shortest verse in the Bible. And the easiest way out of that situation, I'm sure, as uh, some of us can attest to. But I believe that that short verse is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. Because it's so descriptive of Jesus Christ, it captures his full divinity, but also his full humanity, because it's in that 11th chapter of the Gospel of John that tells us the story of Lazarus and that whole situation of whereby he fell sick and everybody was worried about him and he was a friend of Jesus and Jesus heard about his sickness but didn't go to heal him and everybody got very concerned about that. We should go now, Jesus. We should go see him. You're healing everybody. Surely you want to go heal Lazarus. And Jesus says, not yet. I'll go when it's time. And during that period of days, when he finally did go to Bethany, where Jesus had ultimately died, 
And he's with his friends and he's with Mary and Martha and Lazarus's family. And that's when we get that, that, that two word statement. Jesus wept. Jesus, the son of God, Jesus who knew the whole story, he knew he knew where Lazarus was. He knew what, was await, what had been awaiting Lazarus. And he knew the realities of death from his perspective and the realities of life and the realities of heaven. He knew it all. But he was moved to tears in that moment. And I think that teaches us several things this morning. As we think about our own lives, we think about Dear Kathleen and who she was and what she meant to us and the wonderful qualities of life that she had and that she gave to us through her legacy. And one of those things is that life is precious and it's a gift. And Jesus, in his human feelings, we see him there where he was truly emotional about what had happened to Lazarus and what Mary and Martha and the others were feeling in that moment. Their sense of loss, their sense of grief, their sense of, of, of desperation that this would happen to them. And, and, and Jesus entered into that as a, as, as a person, as a man, as a human being. He had those emotions. He felt those emotions and they welled up in him. That's part of the miracle of the incarnation. It's part of God coming to earth in Jesus and him being born as a baby and living his life fully as a human being, feeling everything. No special grace to him in that way. He felt it all. And he wept in that moment. This was his community. These were his friends. The Bible tells us several times that that he loved Lazarus and that Lazarus loved him and that he loved Mary and Martha and they loved him and that they loved each other. They were close together. When this happened, it affected all of them. Even as Kathleen's death is affecting all of us in some way or another. Life is precious. Jesus knew that. This life, this human life, this frail human life that is all we know for X number of years is a very precious gift. And Jesus knew that. And Jesus wept. Another thing that I think the verse Jesus wept teaches us is that death is hard, but death is not final. Death, death is hard, and we shouldn't be afraid to say that. We shouldn't be afraid to feel that. We shouldn't be afraid to acknowledge that. Even after 98 years, I mean, it's easy to say, well, you know, who gets more than 98? Come on. It doesn't matter. We are, we are hardwired to cleave to this life that we have, this life that we know this life that is precious to us, and these relationships that we enjoy here and now. So the sickness and the sorrow and the death, that was all an intrusion on life as Jesus knows it to be. This is not the end. This is not where it stops. This is not over. This is merely a transition into what I have for you next. This is temporary, and this will pass, and there's more to come. Death is hard, but death is not final. And then in John chapter 11, we're given the promise that tells us that there is heaven. Heaven is promised. It's promised to those who believe. John chapter 11, verse 25. When Mary and Martha were probably maybe in the, in the deepest part of their sorrow over Lazarus' death. Jesus has shown up, but he hasn't done anything yet. Lazarus is still dead. We're talking about it, but he's still dead. Jesus says to her, 
I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. So there's the promise there that we have this morning from scripture, from Jesus himself. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, will live even though he dies. And whoever li lives and believes in me will never die. Then he concludes that to Mary by saying, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And Mary says, yes, Lord. She told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. So my question to you this morning, all of us this morning, all of us here, all of us who will be here virtually at some point, perhaps in the future, watching this live stream, the recording of this, the question to all of us is, do you believe this? And that's something for us to consider privately, personally. But with the reality of Kathleen's life, the qualities of faith that she had at all times, in good days, happy days, joyful days, peaceful days, and through very difficult days, very dark days, very challenging times for herself and for her family and related to her health. Yet she had that spark of love and that spark of faith that touched every one of us in so many ways. And I believe that the question that we have this morning that begs to be asked is, do you believe this? What a wonderful time we've had um, thinking about God's goodness, uh, particularly in the life of Kathleen Gilchrist. Um, we pray that God has blessed you. Um, we pray that for you who believe that you have this deep sense of the reality of Christ in you, and this song we're going to sing um, is going to be just a reflection of that, that we begin in faith. We, you know, we don't deserve it. We receive the faith that God has. He takes us through everything, <laughs> and then we just enjoy um, eternity with him. Uh, there's a chorus in this that says, my chains are gone. I've been set free. And we... I did want to say, oh, that's great, Kathleen, her chains are gone. But her chains were gone a long time ago, and she was free. Uh, and she, so that's the reality for us. So this song, um, we can meditate on that. We're going to sing. I'm going to pray. We're going to um, have military honors uh, for Kathleen. And then as the band plays, I want to invite you, those that are staying, if you would exit through the back, and there's an elevator, and there are steps. And I don't know where they are back there, but they're back there. And just invite you to come down and enjoy, enjoy a meal with the family. That would be really lovely. The family would like to have some quiet time here in the chapel. So if you can... Just go down and just begin um, eating. That would, that would be very precious. So will you stand with me and let's sing this song. Um, uh, pray this song. Pray it for yourself. Pray it for the family. And uh, we'll enjoy that together. <laughs>
give you praise, Lord God, for grace. We thank you for your grace that flowed through the life of our friend, Kathleen Gilchrist. We thank you that we can live a life for you. We thank you that heaven is a reality. We thank you for the eternal life that you give. We pray that as she enjoys eternity, that you will be present with those who miss her, that you will reveal yourself as the God of all comfort and all love and all strength. We uh, pray that you will be with us as we enjoy fellowship around the table, hearing stories of grace, remembering with joy, remembering tender moments. We thank you, God, that we have this fellowship because we know you. Be with us. And now, Jesus, we thank you that you died. We thank you that you rose again. We thank you that we can be part of your family, and we give you all the praise. Amen.